So um, I'm calling for the next speaker, Dr. Stefanos uh, Fotio from uh, the UNIP office here in, in Bangkok for his presentation. Dr. Stefanos uh, Fotio is holding a uh, first university degree in forestry and a PhD in environmental resource economics and a master in information systems. Dr. Fotio uh, is the regional coordinator of the UNEP's Resource Efficiency and Sustainable Consumption and Production Program for the Asia-Pacific region. He has managed many international projects dealing with sustainable development with a total budget of more than 100 million US dollar. So that's a real uh, program really. And he has gained a lot of experience on the national, regional and sectoral um, level in sectoral strategies. And uh, he has also an extensive experience as an educator. He has taught a visi as visiting lecturer for six years in the Department of Planning and Management of Natural Resources of the Aristotle University and in the Department of Business Administration of the Uni University of Macedonia. So now we are going more to the macro level, I think, and we are listening to the speech uh, Mainstream Economics and Sustainable Development. Are they compatible? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Buri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me, from this position, to, thanks, uh, to thank the IGs, uh, the IISD and ZZ for inviting me in this session and mainly for giving me an, a floor to decide the, the topic of my presentation. And I have to say, as a staff of the United Nations Environment Program, what I usually present is the work of UNEP on a specific area. But since uh, Peter gave me the freedom to choose the topic of my presentation, I choose to talk for something that I really am passionate and I love, and uh, for something that actually taught me uh, what a big mistake I have done when I was a student, more uh, actually a PhD student, and how wrong I understood economics. Let me say here that when the title of my presentation, mainstream is not a verb, it's mainstream economics. So it is uh, a type of economics that I will explain later, but it's not a verb. So what I wanna talk to you uh, the next, I'll try to do it no more than 15 to 20 minutes and then have some discussion, is explain with a non-technical actually uh, text what is mainstream e economics and mainly based on assumption and models. To give just a snapshot on how economic science is affecting policy making, what are the implications for sustainable development? And what can we do to address some limitations and some of the implications that uh, I will present? Before I start, can I please ask you how many of you in this room you have, you are either economists or you had ever a training of economics? Just to see hands. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, as I told you, my, my presentation is non-technical, so forgive me if the, the economists, please forgive me um, when I will not use the right language. I do it for the overall audience. What is mainstream economics? And when I refer to mainstream economics, I refer to something that many scholars, they call them neoclassical economics, or some other, they call them modern economics. So it is an economic system. It is a theory. It is a system uh, of knowledge that it's based on something that I will call an artificially sophisticated theory. And the mainstream economics, the neoclassical economics, they use mathematical arguments as the driver of the theory and not as the tool. And if we can share this phrase, I think that we will be on the same pace altogether. A huge, a fundamental problem with neoclassical economics is that Mathematics are not a tool to resolve a problem, but is a driver to create a theory. What happened with, with neoclassical economics is that 
At a certain point, economists decided that they don't want to be an art, and they want to be scientists. And they, they said, OK, we cannot be scientists if we, if we don't formalize ourselves. They found mathematics. They contributed nothing to the mathematic science, actually, but they used anything they knew on mathematics to make artificially sophisticated economic models. Mainstream economics shares something that it, it, it's called common knowledge, at least for the macro mainstream economies. And part of this common knowledge is something we have all, uh, all here, I think, this invisible hand that fixes everything in the markets goes back to the founder of neoclassical of, of founder of classical and capitalist economics adam smith the cons cons concept of comparative advantage that countries uh, are existing in this world because they have a comparative advantage and at a certain point some other countries decided that some countries do not have comparative advantage so i i I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll go and colonize them and create a comparative advantage for them and they have done this for 200 years. The marginal utility, that's something that when I was a student, they were trying to, to, to make me understand what is this issue of marginal utility, how much you gain from consuming one additional unit of product. A crazy thing. This is how we drive consumerism. And the, the, biggest, the biggest artificial uh, construction of economics, something that is general, general equilibrium, something that says that our economic system is a stable system. Sometimes we have some small problems. I mean, they call what you see the last two years a small problem, problem, but a correction will come. I mean, the correction will mean tens of thousands of millions of job loss. Uh, some people uh, really lose their life. But for mainstream economists, ah, this has correction, corrections to the system, and many other things. Now, important, all of them are at least 150 years old, at least even 200 years old. And the only new thing that uh, mainstream economics gave to us in the 20th century was the game theory. Give me real, a, a real example of policy where game theory is used, because game theory is an amazing, it's a fascinating <coughs> subject for universities and for scenarios. If, if you have any real case where game theory was used to solve a political problem, please let me know, because I'm ignorant. And asymmetric information, together with externalities, which was a good thing, Stigler uh, at a certain point decided that he would make a revolution, and he would change mainstream economics, and then he went to the World Bank. And he influenced a little bit the World Bank, but finally he, he continued to be a mainstream economist. So the overall approach of mainstream economics is that economic systems are self-determined systems, that they are in an in equilibrium state, and this equilibrium is done by something they call best planning, best distributing mechanisms. And these best planning, best distributing mechanisms, they are based on, on only one thing, which is we set up prices, we create markets, and everything will be resolved. Main assumptions are rationality, that all the choices we do and wait here, not we do as economic agents, we do as humans are rational choices. And this is the most single irrational assumption that we can have in science. That all of us, we are either profit or utility maximizers. The only thing we care about is to maximize our utility. And that out there in the market, there's something they call perfect competition. Now, the economists know that perfect competition means that you have many firms competing uh, on a free and fair market. And again, I'm asking the economists to give me an example of one market and don't give me, please, the market of Patong because this is a perfect co competition. Patong, uh, you know, the market where they sell the, all these um, souvenirs and the fake products, this is probably perfect competition, yeah, because you have hundreds of, 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 of retailers there. But give me an example of a big market. Oil, example. Food. Could you tell me if these are markets of perfect competition? And the result is that mainstream economics, and that's the big, big problem, are not ideology-free. 
mainstream economics have